I, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think is, is the CEO's role in maintaining that kind of power broker status. And, uh, you know, Adam, you can take a cheap shot at someone on the list if you'd like. Uh, you can go for it. Or well, just, I shouldn't say that, but tell us about Tim Cook and what you think about him as the Apple expert. Sure. Um, he's obviously the only non-founder on, on the list. It's a, it's a profound uh, deficiency, a weakness at Apple that their founder is, isn't on this list right now. So I've said that I think Tim Cook will be a, a caretaker CEO until, they, until Apple finds somebody who is more like Steve Jobs. Not another Steve Jobs, but someone with more of his characteristics because Cook has very few of his characteristics. Having said that, I think Cook could be the caretaker for as long as a decade, which is the length of his, uh, his options package currently. Do you think, <laughs> that's a good, good one. Mm -hmm. Do you think it, it, one of his most important goals must be to keep the management team that he has, right? Yeah. So, so I think that among, he has many, many fine qualities. Among them is he's a culture keeper. Steve Jobs defined the culture of Apple. Tim Cook believes in the culture of Apple. And people believe in him. They believe that he loves Apple, that he will do what's right for Apple. He's an unemotional person compared with Jobs. He's highly intelligent, highly competent undoubtedly knows exactly what he's not good at, which is a, it's a, it's a, a, a humble characteristic that a lot of people in general don't have, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, will he be able to keep the management team together? That's, his, that's one of his top goals. That management team has been at Apple for a, every person exactly. on the team, right. with the exception of the new retail chief will be joining shortly, has been at Apple at least since 2000. So the really key question, and they work as hard as they can to keep us from finding out the answer to this, is who's the next level down and how Margaret, good are they? You've known Mark for probably five years at Facebook. What, what, what do you admire about him? I think he is probably, so he, he's very admired for all kinds of things. I think he is underrated as a CEO. He is, I forget how old he is now, but he's extremely 27. Young. 27, thank you. I did some statistics here, a statistical analysis. So he analysis can rent a car, four. right? The average age that's, is 41. That's, that's, a, that's a very big deal. He can, he can rent his own car. But um, <laughs> think about... Because like, there was a time when he, when he couldn't, you're saying, when he was at Facebook? Well, and he no, was the you CEO. Don't you have to be God. 24 or something to rent a car? You get the good like, rate. Right. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> he can rent a car, yay. But no, what he's really done is, um, if you look back in the last eight years, he has assembled probably one of the most magical teams in Silicon Valley. And you know, to do that when you were in your early 20s, never had a job, right? Like never understood, like never talked to a CFO, never met anyone like Cheryl, and, and he's upgraded, right, over the years. And I think that um, the ability as a, a young gentleman who has no business experience to find these people, attract them, upgrade them if you need them to be upgraded, and like do that in an orderly and organized and, and, and powerful fashion is something that people just underappreciate about him. And he's at that age, I mean, like having Cheryl and the CFO who's outstanding all lined up is pretty impressive. So you knew Larry before he was CEO. <laughs> yeah, we hung out. Um, I think it's interesting to when you look at this, Margaret, to your point about the importance of having a founder as a CEO, because this chart is a little bit misleading in that, of course, it was Eric Schmidt that was, um, you know, the CEO that brought the company and really helped the company grow over a 10-year period. And um, then Larry... Who came up with the adult supervision thing? I never liked that. <laughs> you didn't like that? I kind of liked that, because I, I, I was in a few meetings. It was pretty... <laughs> it was really? Pretty you, you decided that actively? <laughs> Well, what, what, what um, tone, how does uh, Larry help set a culture? He was obviously there at the beginning uh, when uh, Sergey and Larry started the business, Eric wasn't around. What about the culture of Google, uh, you know, is reflected in Larry's personality? I think there's a couple of things. One is just, of course, the engineering-driven um, culture is, um, is really important. And then I also think that um, just being able to prioritize, there was, there was one incident. Um, every Friday, uh, we had TGIF, so everyone in the company was invited, and the, and the founders were there, and they would ask questions. You could ask anything you wanted. There was a big decision made, and that was to eliminate the gummy bears um, from the cafeteria. So someone did ask about, you know, to, to the founders, what happened to the gummy bears? And I thought Larry's answer was great. He's like, you know, if that's our biggest problem, then we're in good shape. So I think that's another part of the culture. It's just like, you know, having the right tone, being able to prioritize where the gummy bears belong in the overall strategy.